Hi, uh, I'm Ruthika, an engineer on Twitch Recommendations, and today I'll be talking to you about how we leverage Airflow to manage and orchestrate our model training pipeline uh, for a recommendation model. Um, for those of you that may not know of Twitch, uh, Twitch is the most popular live streaming platform where creators like you and me come together to stream video games, music, sports, and everything else really. Um, and they build communities around like shared passion. Um, last year, the community collectively watched 1.3 trillion minutes of content on Twitch. We have a daily viewership of 35 million viewers. Um, Seven million streamers go live on Twitch every month. And at this scale, we get unique opportunities to apply machine learning across diverse fields. For example, how do we personalize user experience at Twitch? How do we keep our community safe? How do we help our streamers make money doing what they love at Twitch? Um, for this talk, we'll look at how recommendations work at Twitch. This is a snapshot of my homepage. Um, as you can see, recommendations are powered by data-driven machine learning models, which take data about what users have watched before to predict what they, can, what they would want to be interested to watch in the future. So for example, when I land on my homepage, multiple surfaces like browse, search, recommended channels are all personalized to me. You can tell I enjoy watching a lot of music content. On all of these surfaces, we are constantly running experiments to improve some key metrics that we track. For example, total minutes watched on the site, the number of clicks leading to five minute plays, etc. And the real and truly the core of improving our machine learning systems is enabling rapid experimentation. So let's, let me walk you through how a shelf on our homepage gets populated by recommended streams. At any given time, we have about 100,000 concurrent live streams that we would recommend to the user. And narrowing down this list to a handful that we would like to display to the user is a challenging problem. Like most modern recommendation systems, we do this in a two-staged approach. Models in the first stage are called candidate generation, which filters 100,000 streams to a few hundred candidates through doing some pre-computation. This pre-computation looks like embeddings. Um, but pre-computation also means that, we, that, that our models can't really adapt to what a user has just done or what the streams are currently being streamed. So to be able to get a more responsive uh, feedback, we have a second stage called ranking, which where models operate on hundreds of items to provide a re-ranked list in real time. A handful of the top items on this list are then displayed to the user on the UI. So now that we really know what recommendations are, let's quickly take a look at what the tech stack looks like for building these models for both candidate generation and ranking. So, any machine learning activity needs to start with data. We use Redshift to extract data from our central data lake called Tahoe. Next, we need to perform some compute tasks on this data. These tasks could be processing raw features, which are expected by the model, or training a machine learning model, or running evaluation on this model. Um, our compute is provided by AWS Batch that executes these tasks as containers. Now, for the orchestration, we're using Apache Airflow. Um, and our scientists are writing these tasks in Python. Um, the model is trained in TensorFlow, and most of our data transformations are happening in Pandas. So, while it's integral that our production DAGs run reliably with very strong SLA guarantees, production DAGs are really only half the story. Oftentimes, especially for machine learning workloads, ease of experimentation is a lot more critical as developers are spending majority of their time experimenting and trying out new ideas. And only a subset of these ideas actually make it into production. Therefore, for today, I'd like to discuss two important components of our usage at Airflow. What is the authoring experience for the end users at Twitch, which would be the data scientists? Then, also, what is the underlying infrastructure on which these DAGs execute? So to the first point, at the end of the day, data scientists excel at data science things, 
and not necessarily software engineering things. So we'd like to minimize the cognitive overhead involved in attributing and creating some of these DAGs. They don't need to be really exposed to internal details of airflow, where, where they need to train and evaluate their models. So these are some of the tenets that we decided to pursue for our DAG authoring experience. Uh, we also want to make sure that, that they're subscribed to best practices around error handling, retries, pager duty integration, which are automatically baked in so that they don't need to worry about these things and can truly focus on what's critical to their role, which is building better machine learning models. So internally at Twitch, we've built a lightweight DAG SDK that allows us to cu curate a library of shareable tasks that all developers can use and customize to create their DAGs. When a scientist needs to author a training pipeline to train their model, they only need to define a very lightweight workflow, which you can see on the, on the screen, um, where they update business logic for these tasks and define the relationship between these tasks. So we take care of generating the corresponding DAG on the fly using a custom DAG generator. Um, the best practices around execution of these tasks is already baked into our DAG generation module. These tasks internally may, may be figuring out things like, how do you connect to Redshift or any other data source? Uh, or how do you ensure that the state is transferred and being written to S3 so that model developers don't need to worry about passing data between different tasks? Now let's take a look at DAG execution experience. Similar to the DAG authoring experience where we want to lower the cognitive overhead for data scientists, here we'd like to be able to reduce the operational overhead for maintaining our infrastructure. We also wanted to be able to provide very strong isolation guarantees so that other jobs do not impact the execution, execution behavior of any, other job, of any given job. We want to ensure that these jobs are able to successfully run to completion with as less, less of a contention as possible on a variety of different sources. We also want to ensure that promoting a DAG from, from an experimental DAG to production is very easy and doesn't, requ doesn't really require additional engineering effort to productionize pro promising models. So let me, let me take a pause and explain what, we, what, what were the problems that we face at Twitch personally for two of these, uh, two of these issues that I, that I outlined. So all of last year, a big challenge that we were facing at Twitch was that our, our self-hosted shared development airflow cluster wasn't able to keep up with our growing teams. We noticed that our users were unable to test their changes in complete isolation. Testing changes on a shared airflow cluster had a large blast radius where changes from a single developer's DAG may end up breaking the environment for all currently running jobs. As you can tell, this is, not, this is probably not a unique problem. And this gets even more complicated for machine learning workloads because each, each pipeline is running for six to 12 hours. Um, so in particular, testing changes around build processes, um, DAG generation, shared tasks becomes very, very tricky. Our self-hosted Airflow de deployment was also on a really old Airflow version. Um, and we also know that upgrading Airflow versions is a non-trivial task. Uh, especially when the entire organization needs to move from one Airflow version to another. It can be very disruptive to teams, and finding a shared time to do such an upgrade can become a challenge. So to address this, we used AWS's managed offering for Apache Airflow called MWAA to provide easy to deploy dedicated experimenta experimentation stacks for developers that come with little to no operational overhead. A lot of the operational concerns around upgrading versions, operators, monitoring, uh, comes by default as part of the uh, managed offering. Um, and also, MWA ships CDK constructs, which is a framework that we use for defining infrastructure as code. So we're able to really provide these stacks as like self-service. However, shared airflow cluster was not the only problem. Our shared AWS batch resource that provides the compute to run these airflow tasks was also a place of contention, where it was trivial for a single experiment to hoard all GPU boxes, blocking even simple workflows from getting executed. 
Um, for those of you who are familiar with ML workloads, this is actually a very pr common problem because we typically do hyperparameter sweeps on permutation of parameters uh, to learn the best one for the model, and this ends up running multiple jobs in parallel. So, you, so, so it does use up a majority of the resources a lot of times. So how do we guarantee minimum capacity to every developer in a cost-effective manner? So the solution that we took was providing a combination of dedicated compute along with a shared warm pool of instances that guarantee minimum capacity to every developer, as well as make sure that they're able to burst up and access additional capacity on a best effort basis for very heavy workloads. So you can see on the image on my, on my left that each developer gets their own dedicated compute stacks for simple workloads and for the heavier workloads when they need to get some additional compute, they can always kind of uh, share resources from the shared compute pool that we maintain um, as like a warm pool of GPU instances. Um, let's take a closer look at what the, wor what the workflow for the user looks like. So developers build their changes as a Docker image and deploy it to ECR. So any modeling code change that needs to happen for a developer would be built from, from their, they can build it from their local laptop or from their cloud desktop as Docker containers. We provide some custom scripts, scripts to be able to do this. They then use these custom scripts to update the back job definition um, that uses this new ECR image and correspondingly updates these workflows on MWAA. Once a DAG is triggered on MWAA, it submits a batch job on AWS batch using the AWS batch job operator. Uh, and if the, if the job is, is a simple job that does not need GPU instances, because GPU instances come at a premium, so for, for regular workloads, we would direct them to a CPU-based job queue. Uh, for any GPU-based job queue, they typically first run, first try to find instances from their dedicated instance pool, and if they're out of instances from that, they expand into um, using the shared pool of instances. Um, that's all I had, actually. Um, I'll take questions. Uh, just a question of how you're the managed MWAA, um, how it helped you, because uh, it wasn't clear to me how that solved the, the one of the issues you had. Yes, yeah, so I think the main uh, problem that we used to have was like, if we wanted to be able to provide experimental dev stacks, um, providing this in like a self-hosted Airflow cluster comes with a lot of operational overhead. Um, by using MWAA, we're able to just provide them um, as CDK stacks that they can actually spin up on their own. And we don't really need to worry about all of the operational concerns around like version upgrades, um, operator upgrades, uh, or monitoring, because that all comes out of the box. So the additional overhead that we take on for providing such a development stack um, for like a single developer is is very minimal. Did you also uh, move the your production uh, Airflow instance to uh, MWAA? And if so, how was that migration process? That's a great question. That's on our on our next roadmap. <laughs> but we do we do plan to move uh, our production onto MWAA as well. Um, so far. Uh, for our development, MWA has been uh, performing pretty well, so I think that that would be some of our next steps. Uh, for the dedicated compute, is, did you mention that this was like guaranteed for like the smaller workloads or for the bigger ones? So we don't really distinguish between smaller and, and bigger workloads. Uh, we just specify a small uh, shared or a small dedicated compute pool, and then we also provide a fallback to a shared uh, compute pool. So your job could be, if you've got like, if you if you ran 16, you know, or like a big number of parallel jobs, uh, even if they're small workloads and they end up utilizing all your resources in your um, 
in your dedicated pool, you can all, the, 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 the next jobs will pick, it, uh, pick instances from the shared compute pool. So we don't really have a specification of a, sh of a small and uh, heavy workload and that kind of, kind of keeps it more flexible to be able to um, use instances however they want. So for the, the, the managed, the MWAA instances that you spin up, like uh, on the fly for the, for the user requested stuff, how much of that data, if, if at all, I, I'm assuming they also get spun down or like the managed, uh, the MWAA setup for that experiment also gets like removed or whatnot. So for um, like experimentation, I guess provenance, like what happens to the data that was in that airflow instance um, or in that managed, you know, workflows for, yeah, MWAA, what happens to that, I guess? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the MWA instance doesn't really hold much of our data. Um, the only thing that would get spun down if we uh, destroy our airflow cluster would be the S3 bucket, which hosts, which holds our DAGs. And our DAGs really are um, actually like JSON files. So they're a representation of the workflow objects that I showed. Um, and all of our data lives in S3, which is outside of this um, MWA instance. Um, so you would always have, um, you would always have that data sort of um, be present even after you spin them down. Uh, similarly, a big part of our training pipelines is the um, actual model that gets deployed on SageMaker. All of that is also uh, totally outside MWA, so that persists as well. Uh, I was just wondering if there were any drawbacks to like going from like a self-hosted cluster to MWAA. Um, I imagine, you know, Twitch had to move everything to Amazon, but I also want to know like, was there any trade-offs or anything that you're like, hey, we have to do things maybe in a way we didn't like as a result. Just wanted to hear a little bit of like the pros and cons. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of our infrastructure at Twitch um, originally, and even, even now to some extent, is a combination, but still majority is on AWS. So sort of like moving to MWAA kind of made sense for us because we were anyway really heavily invested on AWS. Um, in terms of the drawbacks, um, not, not drawbacks as much, but I would say that some of our customizations that we did um, on, on our self-hosted Airflow cluster, um, when we moved away from that to MWAA, we kind of had to figure out new ways of how we could customize those. Um, and I also, so our Airflow cluster was running a really old version. When I say a really old, it's, it was on 1.9. Um, and, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and um, our, uh, obviously, MWA launched, um, and we, we uh, launched on MWA with 2.3. Um, so a lot of the improvements that we'd actually brought into our self-hosted cluster were already um, provided by the community by then. So I think that also kind of took care of some of the customizations that we'd done. Um, but yeah, in terms of drawbacks, I wouldn't say. Um, yeah, I think cost is probably the only thing, which which is okay for us right now. When you, uh, you said you upgraded from a very old version of Airflow to like Airflow 2.3, um, what were the like pain processes of upgrading? Like there was, did you encounter any difficulties or did you encounter a lot of complex problems from that? Yeah, that's a great question too. So I think it was easier for us than a lot of other use cases because most of our DAGs live outside. Um, so we were not really creating DAGs, um, you know, in your general sense, how you would like write a DAG on Airflow. So really the contract between Airflow and our system was this workflows file, which was like a JSON file that had representation of these DAGs. Um, so the code that we had to upgrade was the DAG generation logic. Um, and also for the DAG generation logic, we were using very basic operators, so just the Python operator and the Airflow batch operator, which made things a lot easier. Um, and yeah, so I would, I would definitely say that if we had to like upgrade versions where we had multiple DAGs, we had to also re-architect, that would have been a, a much bigger um, much bigger undertaking, but in our scenario, really the uh, missing, the actual only piece 
was the tag generation stuff that we had to upgrade. Thank you. Um, I was curious, with the dedicated GPUs that you have for each developer, uh, if I understand that correctly, how do you um, ensure high, uh, oh gosh, I forgot the word, how do you ensure like high usage so the GPUs aren't just like sitting unused? Yeah, that's a really good question too. Um, I think shared compute is sort of our, um, our version of like, optimizing the best uh, the best we can for for a capacity but that being said um, we're running most of our training workloads on p3 instances which are really low like which have very low availability across across AWS so in order to be able to get around that we do maintain a warm pool which means we are paying for these instances um, and yeah and that's that's just something that we we need to do otherwise our jobs are stuck and we aren't able to train our models. Um, but to be able to really maximize uh, whatever we're paying for, we have this sort of shared compute. So our, we have very small, very limited number of uh, vCPUs available in our dedicated pool, and most of them then um, sort of you can maximize into your shared pool. Okay, great. Thank you, Ritika, for a great talk. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>